Thanks, Tom. Um, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, so yeah, as my slide suggests, I'm going to talk about adornment, uh, enchantment, magic, and uh, and ridicule. And it's sort of a talk in sort of four uh, basic sort of chunks. Um, and it struck me sort of sitting here yesterday um, that there is a sort of a real need for some stories around wearables. There's no shortage of technological wizardry uh, and ideas and even magic. Um, but somehow lacking is a sort of a narrative about kind of what this stuff is, is for. And I want to focus uh, at the end of my talk on, on how we might think about the storytelling around wearables as a way of, of, of avoiding uh, their ridicule in society. Um, but I think, you know, first off, it's, it's worth sort of noting that anthropologists have, have always been interested in, in, in wearables of, of, some, um, of some form. And the genius of sort of humankind, in a way, is the fact that, you know, we all kind of have basically the same material uh, culture around us, where we have the same materials to play with, and yet we fashion those into extremely uh, unique and differentiated cultural forms. And those cultural forms go some way to defining, in my view, sort of what practical utility looks like. So it's never the case that, um, you know, what we wear is just what we wear. In fact, the very last thing I suspect that any of you thought about this morning, apart from maybe the addition of a coat, um, was how are my clothes going to keep me warm and dry? They're basic functions, uh, if you will. Um, so even the most sort of fundamental properties of clothing, of what we wear, are doing something other than their basic uh, sort of functional um, uh, needs or, or performing their basic functional needs. Um, and I think the, the thing about our wearables um, is that they extend us into society. So whilst we often talk about our personal dress style and so forth, actually at its very basic level what wearables do is project an individual beyond him or herself into uh, the wider society around them. And I think, you know, take that idea and, and sit with it as I, as I go through the rest of these slides. And so, as I said, you know, the personal styles that we think are, are personal to us are very far from it, typically. You know, they locate us socially and, and culturally in, in society. And they consist of a series of, of codes. Um, whether we are um, wearing mandated uniforms uh, or uniforms, as it were, for the tribes that we exist in, um, we have codes um, upon us um, and codes that are shared. And I think that's, again, a fundamental point. They allow us both to be read uh, and to read others um, and to place uh, people. And I think our membership, therefore, of cultures is very much about our ability to do that reading, right? And the, uh, I think one of the challenges kind of coming, going forward, and I'll touch on it, is, is when our wearables are enchanted, when they're augmented in ways um, that we're beginning to imagine, what will be uh, our ability to read those wearables of others? And what ability will we have to control the way in which we're read and others can be read? So I think that's the unlimited power that non-augmented wearables have. And we need to think about how that ability will be transformed and have transformative power uh, into the future. And so what I'm suggesting, I suppose, is that there is a, a software, uh, a way of thinking about wearables as, as, as having a sort of a software layer. Um, codes aren't equally shared across society. I think the bow tie is a, is a good example. I mean, actually, it's just like tying your shoelaces. But that practical statement of fact doesn't prevent many people finding that a very difficult thing to do. So class and cultural capital 
is encoded in the sort of software layer of many wearables. So those cultural kind of competencies, I think, are a crucial thing, again, to take forward into the wearable future, to think about the extent to which the software layer is truly readable and shareable. But if I'm focusing a little bit on the software, I think it's also worth exploring um, the hardware layer too. Um, and Gandhi is a really good example of somebody who took the hardware of the material, cardi, homespun, cotton, and mobilized that as a, as a primary sort of symbol in the independence struggle in India. Um, and it was the material that actually they used as a, as a, as a, as a battle uh, element in, in the fight against the imported Lancashire cotton um, and became and still is a very primary symbol of, 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 of Indian culture. So when you see the Congress leaders all wearing their khadi, they were actually exploiting the hardware level of that, of that material. And I think it's also worth pointing out that the chukka, the, the loom on which um, that cotton was spun, is the chukka in the middle of um, the Indian flag. And it's the process of making which is really central to the power of the hardware level of Cardi. And again, I'll touch on that in terms of our wearable future, because that process of production, I think, is, is a central element which allows clothing to be and to become enchanted. And so what I want to throw out, I guess, is, 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 a, is a framework for thinking about wearables, which includes the hardware you know, the very stuff that we wear, the software, which is the kind of the code and the codes which place us and place the clothing in schemes of meaning and schemas of classification. But I also want to sort of force us to think a little bit more about, you know, what, I'm not sure the analogy stretches this far, but into the firmware level too. So the symbols and the syntax of, uh, of our wearables so again, hold these three levels in mind because I want to return to them as a way of thinking about how we inoculate our, our wearables against, uh, against ridicule. So to sum up where we're at um, from this sort of first and rather larger quarter of the talk, um, our wearables are already extremely smart. As I've suggested, they place us in society, they place us culturally, they give people the power to read us, and to be, and for us to read them. Um, they embody a shared set of codes, and in doing so, they position us versus other people. And so that smartness, I think, is already there. I loathe the word smart in, as a prefix to cities, homes, and everything else, because I think it detracts from the, the innate smartness of much that we have around us already. And in fact, much of the te technological augmentation does very little to make clothes or anything else that much more smart in my view. Um, so I want us to think uh, really about the ways in which clothing are already doing a lot of this work, are already placing us in society, and in that sense, reinforcing uh, reinforcing society. So the way in which I think we could think about clothes as, as creating and maintaining distinctions between social, cultural, ethnic, and other groups. That power is already inherent. So in that sense, <clears throat> I want to talk about sort of wearables as, 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 as technologies of enchantment. And I'm using this distinction or borrowing it or stealing it from an anthropologist called Alfred Gell, who made a distinction between technologies of enchantment and the enchantment of technology. And in the technology of enchantment, really what Alfred Gell was talking about was the way that all artistic endeavors, be they painting, art, sculpture, and of course fashion, um, are more than just technological creations they're part of technological systems that are essential for the reproduction of society. 
if you like, and rather simplistically, they're a form of propaganda that persuades individuals of the necessity and the desirability of the existing social order. So these artistic creations, in a sense, uh, they, uh, they create the conditions for our acquiescence in, this, in the social order that is, is the given around us. Um, and they do that, as I suggested, with, with Gandhi and his loom, through the, through the means of production. It's the technical processes of creating artistic output that in many ways form the basis for uh, their ability uh, to enchant us. That's where the power comes from. Savile Row's power, in a way, the Savile Row suit, the power from that comes from the apprenticeship, the long periods of training and skills and expertise, the language, the discourse around the suit uh, and its creation. And so, <clears throat> for Alfred Gell, the technologies of enchantment are made possible by the, uh, by the uh, the, sorry, the enchantment of technology is made possible uh, by the technologies of enchantment. I'll say that again. <laughs> it's a very dense text. So, <clears throat> the enchantment of technology is, is what... It, the technologies of enchantment make the enchantment of technologies work. Have I lost you? I've lost myself. Um, <clears throat> so... Let's start again. <laughs> um, so as I said, it's the, it's, the, it's the technical, the power of the technical process that goes into the creation of the thing that uh, casts the spell over us. It, 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 it portrays the world in an enchanted form, and that enchanted form is actually what creates the power of the item. Now this man had ready back for breakfast, those of you who are old enough to remember the adverts. But I think there's a, there's a sense in which the enchantment that is already in, inherent in our clothing will be amplified into the future. Um, when clothing is able to speak in, in augmented ways to those around us, not just the codes, the schemas that it already taps into, but is able to do something uh, in a more amplified way, um, we're going to see radical kind of transformations in, in, that, in those forms of, of enchantment. And I want to talk now about what those might look like. And I think a good starting point for that is the, is the, the novel by um, uh, Gary Steingart, Super Sad True Love Story, uh, which is a kind of set in a near-term uh, dystopia of, of America. Um, and what he, what he envisages as a device, many of you might be familiar with the work, uh, is a device called the Apparat. It's a pendant that is hung on the, uh, around the necks of, 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 of not all, but, but many individuals, which allows those individuals' social position and their status to be read um, by everybody. And in the near term, what he's, I mean, in the present, he's, he's actually exploring the sort of the careless and somewhat carefree sharing that we already do on social media. And then he's transposing that vision into a future where there's actually much less control over, over that process. So there's a passage where he talks, I'll let you read it, but um, there's a passage where he talks about a trip uh, between uh, an individual uh, and his, his, his girlfriend, who go into a, uh, into a, into a store, and, and he talks about how the apparat quickly zoomed in past the data outflow spilling from the customers like polluted surf. And he's able to, to kind of understand and position and see intimate details of the sales assistant. Um, and as you can see, some of that is perhaps not stuff that the sales assistant would necessarily uh, wants everybody to know. So Steingart is, is really pushing on the near term and, and the way in which social data is being shared. And then he's saying, well, what if that was kind of coming out of us, was emanating from us in ways that may or may not be controllable? And I think that throws up a series of questions. And I'm going to choose three, but I think there are many more uh, things that we could kind of explore. Um, 
One for me is about sort of what power dressing may mean in that kind of future. Uh, the second is kind of what the dress code or the code for that wearable future might be. And the third is to sort of speculate on what the role of clothing in that sort of future uh, might become. So one could easily imagine in an apparat-like future where our clothes are bathed in social data, which is uh, readable for, 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 for vast, uh, vast numbers of people around us, that we could literally wear our social status on our, on our sleeve, on our lapel. Um, and you could think of lots of ways of corrupting that. So p before coming on stage as a speaker, one could suddenly buy you know, 50,000 followers on Twitter and have those kind of emanating um, from the stage. Um, and so uh, in many ways, I think, you know, it, it throws up some questions about what the, uh, what the role of, of kind of power and status will be when, when your clothes are not only just doing the work that they already do, positioning you in your Savile Row suit or what, what have you, um, but push you further um, into a realm where you can uh, exploit uh, that power imminent in, in, in data-driven clothes. I think it also then throws up questions, therefore, about power and control. So who can read who? Well, we talked earlier about the ways in which clothing is, has immense power because its codes can be read. By, by many, take that further to augmented data led, no data dripping clothes. Who owns the OS for this? Who's able to hack it? You know, who's able to kind of manage what comes out of you and in what form that's readable? So these are speculations about this future, um, but I think they're ones that um, we should be having now. And perhaps I shouldn't say this in a, in a school which is dedicated to fashion, but Steingart talks about people wearing see-through onion, onion skin kind of clothing, clothing that doesn't actually need any kind of performative or aesthetic power because it's got this data kind of coming out of it. And so does clothing in that world become almost a dumb pipe? It's kind of the data that you augment it with and then project that becomes the power. Um, so I think it reaches out, clothing in that world could reach out in previously kind of unthought of ways. And it takes us, you know, if we take this basic notion of clothing kind of extending the self into society, I think it does that um, sort of in spades. So the third sort of piece in this jigsaw, as it were, of thoughts is, is about magic. Um, now, I think we tend to think of magic as the preserve of primitive peoples who don't have technological capabilities. Their ab the lack of technological uh, capabilities um, forces them to think in terms of magic. I think that's the wrong way to look at it because I think all technical activity is an inherently uncertain activity with uncertain outcomes. And so I think magic sort of emerges not as a sort of as an, as an antidote to lack of technical expertise, but in many ways is fundamentally a piece and a part of all technological activity. And it's one that, that animates it. Um, and I think the way it does that is, in many ways, a, ma a flying car right, has appeal to us because it, it represents a, a shadow against which our existing understandings and experiences of driving cars can be benchmarked. So magic, in many ways, for me, is a productive force in this world, the wearables world, but in all technological uh, contexts, because it provides a benchmark against which we can strive um, to do things. But I think that leaves sometimes magic with two very kind of opposing um, roles or, or there's a tension certainly between these for this, this form of magic because if on the one hand magic is what we strive to achieve through our technical, technological innovations, for those of you that have worn a Google Glass, you'll sense that to some extent there's some ridicule 
uh, inherent in that magical device that you, that you wear. And so I want to sort of set up the idea that on the one hand, magic is this extremely productive force in our technological, innovative um, endeavors, and yet it leaves us extremely exposed to creating gadgets that are, that are open to ridicule. Now, for those of you who've ever read an innovations catalog, or if you've been on an American plane, the SkyMail uh, catalog, you'll know that the world is full of gadgets which posit problems um, which they aim to solve. And I think part of the problem that we face as an industry, and I say that in the broadest possible way because I don't know kind of what industry we necessarily represent, is that I think we're in a position where we may be creating facial wigs or chairs that we can glue to our bottoms um, to solve the problem um, of not having a chair when we need one. And so I think the problem that faces the wearables world right now is we need to posit the existence of a problem, the solution to which we have. And until we do that successfully, we're gonna be in a situation um, where our gadgets are just utterly exposed to ridicule. Now, I don't know of any of you who have ever seen people doing Nordic walking. I mean, it's an amazing thing. I mean, walking is, I suppose, what defines us as human beings, right? That's Homo sapiens. They got up onto two legs and they started walking. But the Nordic walking industry is, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in, in revenue, and there are tens of millions of people around the world that do it. There are trade associations, there are professional training bodies, and lots of people do it. It's extremely good um, aerobic exercise, but it looks a little bit silly. Um, and I think what's interesting is that something that is perhaps arguably open to ridicule, and if you've ever seen people do it, um, you'll understand what I mean, um, they have turned something um, they've turned, in this case, a wearable into something desirable, pleasurable, and very much doable. And they've done that through thinking about the hardware, the software, and the firmware level of Nordic walking. And I'll, turn, I'll come back to summarize what I mean by that at the end. I think Segway's a counterpoint here because whilst the Segway was going to transform the way that we navigated cities and in the early stories about Segwaying, you know, it was going to become the most transformative technology of the 21st century, it's, whoops, it seems to me that that's not turned out um, to be the case. It seems to be quite good for traveling around Barcelona in guided tours, but it certainly hasn't transformed the cities in the way that it's uh, original funders um, anticipated. And I think it's not done that because unlike Nordic walking, no one figured out what the story would be. So what was the software level of segueing versus the software level of, um, of Nordic walking? For Nordic walking, it was about creating and redefining stories about the outdoors, about exercise, at about aerobic exercise. The stuff of, a, of Nordic walking was about innovating these sticks. It was about getting designers like Marimekko to, to kind of innovate around the design and the aesthetics of these sticks. And it was about giving people the skills that they needed to actually operate um, these sticks and to learn how to walk properly with them. And so for me, what's really important as we think about the wearable future is, is how we simultaneously consider not just the stuff, there's plenty of stuff here uh, on display, um, but we mobilize that stuff in terms of the stories about it. What's the story that we need to tell to give it some, not just even intellectual, but moral or other purpose? And then what are the skills we need to give people so that they can do it. So, you know, what is wearabling? You know, what is segueing? Segueing doesn't seem to have emerged as a practice in the same way that Nordic walking has. And so my injunction to, to you all is, is to focus on the ing. You know, what's the practice? What are you trying to get people to do? Is it walking? 
Um, what's your ing for your device? What's the practice that you want that device to enable? And it's only if you do that, I think, that you can inoculate your gadgets against ridicule. Because unless you do that, you're spewing out, and I, I'm sort of saying you. I don't mean to be so sort of um, critical and, and point the finger. But until we do that, I think we're just producing stuff which is extremely open to ridicule, in part because it's extremely magical, right? But that tension within magic is not being resolved. And it struck me yesterday that the wearables industry, if such a monolithic thing exists, is very similar to a field I worked in for five years, aging technology. There are an awful lot of innovations, there are an awful lot of startups, there's an awful lot of EU and other money flooding into that realm, right? But no one has really got beyond gadgets, right? Robots for carrying Italian elders upstairs, you know, or feeding people with dementia, you know, Yes, those are gadgets, but what are we trying to achieve with those? And what's the kind of, what's the stories and the skills that are gonna be required to make those gadgets come to life? So I think as you kind of move forward on this journey, that's the kind of way, at least one way to think about it. If you don't inoculate against, um, against ridicule through stories, skills, and stuff, in combination, we won't be getting any much further on this journey. Thank you.